Good morning and welcome. On behalf of Juvenile Welfare Board of Pinellas County, our board, leadership, and staff, welcome to the seventh annual Juvenile Welfare Board Summit. My name is Susan Ralston and I'm the chair of Juvenile Welfare Board. A lot has changed and challenged us in this last year, and we are delighted that you're able to join us, albeit virtually, this morning. In fact, a record 651 people signed up for today's event. For the past six years, we've hosted an in-person event in partnership with the St. Petersburg College Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions at the Seminole campus. While this is our first virtual event, we're pleased to continue our partnership with St. Petersburg College Collaborative Labs. I'd like to start by acknowledging my colleagues on the Juvenile Welfare Board. Vice Chair, Mr. Michael McCurick. Secretary, the Honorable Rick Butler, Pinellas Park Vice Mayor. Mr. Brian Angst, our immediate past chair. Dr. Michael Grego, Pinellas County Schools Superintendent. The Honorable Bruce Bartlett, Pinellas Pasco State Attorney, Division Chief Jim Milliken, the Honorable Sarah Mallow, Pinellas Pasco Public Defender, the Honorable Patrice Moore, Sixth Judicial Circuit Judge, and the Honorable Karen Seal, Pinellas County Commissioner. It's a pleasure to serve alongside each of you. Thank you for your service and for your dedication. Now, a moment of silence. We fondly remember the Honorable Bernie McCabe, a vital, a vital member of our board who we lost earlier this month. During his 20 years of service, Mr. McCabe was the cornerstone of our board. He held us accountable and he was steadfast in his commitment to always do what's best for children. He will be greatly missed. Mr. McCabe joined us in 2000 after a legislative change added both his position as state attorney and the public defender position to our board. His counterpart and colleague and friend, the Honorable Bob Dillinger, retired as public defender and he left our board in December. They were both formidable leaders on our board and we are forever grateful for their service to kids. While we cannot see them, joining us today are Juvenile Welfare Board leadership and staff members of our three community councils, our funded agency leadership and staff, as well as a number of Pinellas County dignitaries and community partners. Thank you all for stepping up to serve, support and care about our county's children, especially this year. A bit of virtual housekeeping. Throughout the morning, please share comments in the chat we will also share pertinent links and information in the chat. We ask that questions be entered into the Q&A feature, in particular during our keynote presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce JWB's Chief Executive Officer, Beth Houghton. Susan, this Beth year Mark Beth just finished her first year as our CEO, and what a year it's been. Our board is so pleased with how Beth led us through this extraordinary time. We're grateful not only to Beth, but to her, but to her team as well. Gosh, sorry for stepping on such a nice introduction. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, this year marks the Juvenile Welfare Board's 75th anniversary, and throughout our history, we have accomplished many milestones. 
but 2020 tested us like no other. We learned how important relations are, relationships are, the need to pivot and be responsive, and just how resilient we could all be. We are so proud of the commitment and work of JWB's board, staff, and community councils, and of our funded agencies and community partners who all came together to serve our children and support our families. The pandemic underscored how critical it is that JWB continue to invest responsibly so all children have equitable opportunity to fulfill their potential and ultimately achieve meaningful and purposeful lives. In spite of last year's challenges, we remained on track and ended the year with our board adopting a new five-year strategic plan. And I'd like to share some of the highlights of that with you. We have recommitted our organization to the principles of cultural competency, which are integrated throughout our new plan. With COVID, we have seen an unprecedented need for food. Families have lost income, fallen behind on rent and utilities, and faced eviction. Our Family Services Initiative will have an even greater focus on stabilizing families to connect community resources, meet basic needs, and prevent homelessness. There are also fears of COVID-related learning loss, which many have called the COVID slide. Our new strategic plan features an evaluation and expansion of effective literacy services, along with continu the continuation of academic supports and a focus on third grade reading proficiency driven by JWB's grade level reading campaign. Pandemic related anxiety and trauma for parents and children are off the chart. Sadly, last year we saw suicides among Pinellas County youth triple from the prior year. Now more than ever, our focus on children's mental health is critical. Our new plan calls for the expansion of our pilot, further integrating behavioral health screenings and therapists within pediatric offices, as JWB continues to lead system-wide coordination efforts. Plus, with great intentionality, we have added social-emotional measures across all of our focus areas, so we have a better understanding of the whole child. Even our youngest children have been impacted by the pandemic. A five-year-old girl recently gave her teacher this drawing of herself just because it was how she was feeling. And isn't that really how all of us feel? We think this speaks volumes and validates that JWB is on the right track to increase prevention, early detection, and intervention for children experiencing trauma. We are pleased to announce the addition of a new strategic focus area for early childhood development as part of our five-year plan. While we have always included that age group within our school readiness bucket of work, we are recommitting to this age, age group and, uh, and are very excited about the opportunities. And you, you will see more as we hear the, the keynote speech today as, what in, as to what inspired our board to sort of double down on, the, on these children. So that this new result area will assess young children in order to link them to critical services early engage parents, grandparents, and significant adults in a child's life to promote healthy caregiver relationships, launch a zero to three campaign aimed at ensuring children meet critical developmental milestones and to promote broad understanding and application of early education principles, strengthen and continue home visiting programming targeting high-risk populations, and in partnership with the Early Learning Coalition, expand the capacity for high quality childcare for children birth to age three in areas of historically low opportunity. This new focus on a child's first 1000 days 
is so important. We know those early years are critical to shaping the brains and the futures of our county's children. All one has to do is to watch the video from a powerful study conducted by Harvard University that shows a child's need for connection from very early in life. This video has been viewed over 10 million times. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my good girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. No matter how many times I see that video, I am always blown away by it. Given this research, coupled with JWB's new strategic focus, we've invited Dr. Depesh Navsaria, an expert in the field of early brain and child development, to give our keynote today. I first heard Dr. Navsaria speak at a Florida Children's Movement event, and I found he was as informative as he was engaging, and am, am so excited that he's willing to join us here today. Dr. Navsaria is a pediatrician working in the public interest. He blends the role of physician, educator, public health professional, child health advocate, and occasional children's librarian an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Navsaria presents nationally on early brain and child development, early literacy and advocacy. He has extensive involvement with Amer the American Academy of Pediatrics at both the state and national levels and is the founding medical director of Reach Out and Read Wisconsin. During his presentation, we ask that you enter your questions into the Q&A feature. JWB's Chief Administrative Officer, Linda Levy, will moderate a brief Q&A at the end. And in the event we run out of time, 
Dr. Nafsaria has graciously agreed to answer the balance of the questions and his responses will be electronically shared with attendees after the summit. So get ready to hear a thought provoking presentation on how early experiences elevate everything. Thank you so much, Beth. I really appreciate that kind uh, introduction. And thank you to all of you for uh, tuning in today to uh, uh, listen to what we have to share. I'm just going to share my screen here with my first slide here. And we should be good to go there. All right. Um, so first of all, um, thank you. It's uh, a lot colder up here in Wisconsin and we have had recent snow and more snow on the way. Uh, so this is one of the downsides of virtual presentation is that I don't get to go uh, travel around the country as much as I usually have been. Uh, it's almost a year since I've gotten on a plane, but you know, that's okay. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get there eventually, slowly but surely. Um, so let me start in with this talking about the world of the early brain. A lot of the concepts that I talk about today may be things that are very familiar to you. And that's great. Um, I, I always find that hearing these things in different ways, different perspectives, different connections, however, often help us make the case here. Because I really would like you to be able to think about how can you use this information to help you do a better job in whatever field you work in, or to advocate for funding, resources, or build collaborations different between different places, because I think there's a there's a there's a lot that a uh, lot of room for that in different different areas. We have the standard disclosure slides we always do in the medical world. No oral and financial relationships are disclosed. No off-label investigations in my presentation. However, I always point out that I don't know that the FDA has ever approved mouthing as a use of board books. This is my son. Uh, he is now a college freshman. He's really embarrassed that I show this photo. So of course I show it as often as I can. <laughs> All right. So when people, when I tell people that one of the things I do as someone who's done primary care for many years is to talk to families about reading together with their children at their regular checkups. This is usually the response I get. Oh, that's so nice. Well, yeah, it is a nice thing, but I wanna move us beyond that idea of nice, cute, oh, lovely, to really say, hang on, when we do that thing, when we have successful shared reading together between a parent and a child or other types of interactions, that what we're doing is actually absolutely critical. Okay, it's not just a nice thing. And, and that's, that's kind of the, the journey we're gonna go on today. So on that journey we're gonna have this morning, I'm going to talk a bit about the science. I promise this will not be a highly technical talk because I really want to talk about what the science tells us and how we can apply that. I'm going to talk a bit about results, solutions, and then finally try to you know, wrap it up from there. And again, I do invite your questions and whether we get to them live and in person or afterwards, please ask them. I really do want this to be as useful for you as possible. However, Yes, I do actually have a children's uh, librarianship degree. Long story as to how that happened. Uh, but let me, let me start by telling you a story, um, reading aloud to you um, from a book that you may know or you may not know called The Dot by Peter, Peter Reynolds. So you'll see the images appear as I read aloud to you. Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There. Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Hmm. She pushed the paper toward Vashti and quietly said, Now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment, well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week, when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot she had drawn, her dot, all framed in swirly gold. Hmm, I can make a better dot than that. She opened her never before used set of watercolors and set to work. Vashti painted and painted, a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. The blue mixed with the yellow, she discovered she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting, lots of little dots in many colors. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. 
Vashti splashed her colors with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. Vashti even made a dot by not painting a dot. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's many dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're a really great artist. I wish I could draw, he said. I bet you can, said Vashti. Me? Oh, no, no, not me. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle. And then she said, sign it. There's a reason that I chose that book, and uh, we'll come back to why that is, but let's move on now to talk about the world of the early brain. So over 10 years ago, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child came out with a report where they tried to synthesize really decades worth of research and say, what does this really mean for how we give advice, for how we set up programs, and how we develop good policy? And even though this is now 14 years old almost, everything they say is still beautifully important, is still absolutely true, and has been supported by further research going on since then. So let's walk through those points real quick. First, child development is a foundation for community and economic development. We, know, we, don't, we don't talk about children and, and, and brain development in that way often, right? When we think about infrastructure, we think about highways and bridges and tunnels and airports. But the thing is, the infrastructure of the brain should be thought about the same way that we talk about those investments. Because if your society doesn't have anyone in it, right, that's capable, what do all those things um, what, how do all those things matter, right? So we need to be thinking about that as an investment in the same way as those physical items. Number two, brains are built over time. Yeah, early, early brain matters, as you'll hear me go on about today. But it also means that you can't just stop at age three or age five or age eight or even age 30, right? We have learning needs and brain needs throughout our entire lives. The other thing also to keep in mind is that if we didn't get it right early on, there's always opportunity for recovery, right? Please don't think anything I say today means, oh, once, once you hit five, if it didn't go right, it's all gone. Nope, nope, there's always a chance. It takes more work, more effort, but it's always, always a possibility. So there's sort of a three-legged stool for thinking about children's trajectories. One part is the biological medical stuff that we look at all the time. That's why we look at it, it's important. But then we realized that there was something missing if you only looked at this, uh, these items, that it was the socioeconomic environment, that the zip code that a child is born and brought up in matters more than their genetic code to their outcomes has been clear to us for a very long time. But then we realized it wasn't just the broader socioeconomic environment. It was also the microenvironment children are in. Who's at home? Who's in their early childhood center? Who's in their neighborhood? And how are those folks interacting? And those attachment and relationship patterns really make up the third leg of the stool and is really what we've been putting a lot of focus on alongside the other two. Okay, don't, don't forget about the other two. Still got to work on those. But what, what is going on in terms of those everyday interactions? And that's the third point, that there's two things that shape how that brain is wiring early in life. How do those neurons connect to each other? So one, you need a blueprint for how do you connect one neuron to another, but then which neuron connects to what and for what purpose? That's molded by experiences, okay? That the environment around children, and you can't have one without the other, okay? It's like a campfire. You need wood and a spark to get that fire going. So you can't modify genes so much. I'm not gonna get into the field of epigenetics today, but we can modify experiences. And how do we do that? Well, through the advice we give, the programs we set up and the policies that we enact. So then if you said to me, okay, great, but what's the one thing that matters most? Okay, what's the thing that makes the biggest difference here? The active ingredient is the interaction children have in these back and forth serve and return, like in tennis, you wally that ball back and forth with your partner, engagement in relationships with loving, caring adults around them. Okay, this is the most important thing I'm saying this entire morning. If you remember nothing else, please, this is what to remember. The single thing that drives development forward in young children is the back and forth engagement they have with loving, nurturing adults in their environment. 
And everything we can do to protect, promote, and allow that to happen is absolutely the, the, the single big, biggest investment we can make. This is really key because parents get bombarded with all sorts of messages, right? Put your kid in front of this DVD, it's educational. Um, we'll have them watch this YouTube video, it's good for their brain. This app will help them learn. There's actually no data, no evidence showing that any of that makes a difference for children on their own. It's actually when the person is there with them. As one of my colleagues says, there is no app to replace your lap. T-shirts available online. No, I'm kidding, um, right? But this is the message that, that people need to get, right? That, that it's they that matter. And if they're confident and clear in how they do that, then that's where we see the biggest payoff, not in gimmicks, quite honestly. Usually this is where I show the video that you just saw, but you just saw it. That face-to-face -face paradigm, I actually worked for Dr. Tronic as an undergraduate. Um, I, I sat there coding these videotapes for, for, many, for many years, um, uh, for several years, uh, over countless hours. The key thing I want you to take away from that beyond the obvious piece there is that um, it's not just about you know, the, 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 the back and forth and all that, because the hard part was when we would see parents go into that still face and the kids would not seem to be bothered by it, right? They didn't cry like the baby you saw. Why? Well, not because, because their parents basically, they weren't used to this back and forth interaction. And that made a big, big difference there. So they didn't feel the loss of it when they didn't have that interaction going on. Now, here's the thing. Um, this, the, I don't believe any parent out there doesn't love their child. I don't believe they don't care about them. I don't believe they want the best for them. There's no group out there that has cornered the market on being able to love their children better than any other group. Okay, I wanna be really clear about that. The thing is, these interactions, we think of them often as natural, automatic, instinctual. Guess what, they're not. They're learned behavior. We all learned how to do this if we feel confident in doing it, right? How did we learn it? Be people around us did it. We patterned it off of what they saw. And we did it there. But if you're in environments where you don't see people talking to young children, the back and forth, the face to face, all of that, well, then how would you know how to do it? So you might see an information gap issue, right? You might see that, oh, if only parents knew that they were supposed to talk or read or sing or play with their child. Okay, fine. You put up billboards, you run ads, you put a sign up on the bus, whatever, right? Okay, that's great. Guess what? Most parents have seen those, right? They've seen them because we've done them. But here's the thing, you go home and you sit your six month old down, you start talking to them and you start wondering, am I doing this right? What am I supposed to say to my kid? Maybe I'm not doing this right. You know what? I struggled in school. I, I, I'm, I, I'll probably screw my kid up. Here, let me put them in front of this learning DVD. It says it's made by educators, right? You see that cycle of self doubt and no one's there to say, no, 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 you're doing it right, really. So what we need is coaching, modeling, encouragement. So we're not just spanning an information gap, we're spanning a skills gap, right? And we all have skills gaps, right? We don't take medical students on the first day of med school and say, go take out that appendix. That'd be crazy, right? That'd be ridiculous, they'd kill people <laughs> over and over, right? We, we teach them how to do it. Why is it any different for parenting, right? So we need to recognize that parents need some help, they need support, they need guidance. All right, fourth point, you need simple circuits and skills to do more complex stuff. Pretty clear, pretty important there, et cetera. Play is the work of infancy, as T. Barry Brothers and others have said. So when people say, oh, early childhood, these kids are just playing. Why are we paying for that? Um, it's their job. Play is actually not about amusement alone. It's actually about developmental skill building. Okay, so if you wanna think of early childhood centers as early workforce development programs, hey, be my guest. You know, on some level, yeah, that's what we're doing. All right, this next point, that toxic stress, we'll spend a little time on this and I'll define it more carefully in a moment, but it's associated with persistent neuroendocrine effects and it damages the developing architecture of the brain and can cause lifelong problems as you'll see here. So this is a head CT, just to uh, give you, orient you here. This is as if you're looking in the head as if there's a cut through the head here, looking up into the brain. Okay, the child on the left is a typically developing child. The child on the right underwent extreme emotional neglect. Okay, not, not physical, but emotional. They were bathed and fed and clothed. 
but they did not have a lot of interaction. Um, this was clearly not an experiment. It would be deeply unethical. Um, this, was the, this was a child from a large Eastern European orphanage in the 1980s. It was like a warehouse. Too many kids, not enough staff. Got their very basic physical needs met, but very little interaction. Okay, now without knowing much about how to read a head CT, you can see a big difference right there. That brain is smaller. It looks shrunken. It doesn't look as dense with neurons as the one on the left. I'm giving you a very extreme contrast because you can see that again without knowing much about how to read a head CT. And, and you can see, so the brain, the development of the brain just in three years, right, is clearly affected just by that psychosocial environment um, around it, around that child. Now we all have a built-in stress response. That built-in stress response is really helpful, right? If you're walking along in the woods and you suddenly see a snarling hungry bear, uh, yeah, you want to have a stress response. You're not sitting there going, gee, I wonder what this bear is. Maybe it's a friendly creature. No, you want to run, scream, hide, um, fight, whatever needs to happen. Um, this stress response is a big neurological response. You put out these stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. Great, wonderful. The thing is, this is a great system if you're walking along and you're occasionally experiencing mortal danger. It's a terrible system, as you'll see, for dealing with everyday stressors that build up that young children are being asked to cope with without anything else kind of calming things down, protecting them, guiding them, and so on. So the thing is, I don't want people to walk out of here saying kids should never have stress, okay? Um, stress, actually, small amounts of stress is good. We have positive stress, small increases in heart rate, a little bit of stress hormone. This is how you learn things. So for example, when I logged on this morning to join you, um, the camera I usually use on my display was not working. Usually that would cause extreme panic and fear and uncertainty and doubt, but I'm like, oh gosh, this has happened again. It's this glitch. Uh, it's unpredictable, but I know what to do to fix it. And I have a backup and realigned things. And hey, here I am, hi, um, right? That the stress of having gone through that previously and knowing exactly what to do to fix it, it was like, eh, okay, whatever, I'll get, this will be all fine, right? It's a learning experience. This is why we keep give people exams, etc. You can have more serious stressors, but they're temporary, and if they're buffered by supportive relationships, then they're tolerable. It's okay. It'll be fine. I'm not going to argue it's great, but it's not awful either. And then you have toxic stress. This might be the same stressors as tolerable stress but they're prolonged and there's few or no protective relationships. And that's what one of the big things about toxic stress is that, that, that buffering, that ability to protect you from it, from someone else, that relationship may be the primary factor. And you can even think about it as a vector of disparities between generations. So in a child's life, what if the situation is worse? What if there's no supportive relationships? Things like child abuse, parental substance abuse, homelessness, and so on and so forth. These cause things to happen in the young child. And I'm talking about a really young kid, a kid who's 11 where everything was just fine and then all of a sudden their life falls apart at 11. I'm not gonna argue it's great, but even an 11 year old has some coping strategies and mechanisms. A one year old doesn't, right? You can't, you can say to an 11 year old or a 15 year old, you know, you should have told a teacher when your parent was beating you or when you lost your home and your parents didn't seem to know how to deal with it or, or whatever the case may be, right? Like they're capable of doing that. You can't go to a one-year-old and say, well, why didn't you look for a homeless shelter, right? They don't have that skill um, uh, yet. These young children, what happens is they get into this cycle um, that causes problems that we call toxic stress. Okay, so let's talk about what that cycle is. The stressors happen, okay? This is the, the metaphorical equivalent of the bear, right? Except it's around them, it's in their lives. This fight, flight, or flee response, the, the bear response, they start hitting that red alert button all the time because that's the only response they have to stress, right? They're young kids, they're going for their built-in response. They haven't learned how to do more sophisticated things yet. They pump out these hormones. It causes some changes in the brain, but you know what? Here's what we see in clinics, in, in, in schools, in, in early childhood centers, et cetera, is this hyper-responsive stress response. They're not as calm. They can't cope as well. And that in turn feeds more stress. 
this cycle is what you really need to get here because that response, you know, hey, this kid, this three-year-old in preschool, like nothing happened or something minor, trivial happened. And they went screaming down the hall or hiding under their desk. And everyone says, oh my goodness, what is wrong with this kid? That's the wrong question. The right, the right question is, what happened to this kid? What happened? Because what you're probably seeing is a protective response, a shielding response that has kept that child mostly intact, safe at least, in that early period uh, of life in the environment they've been in. But the problem is we need to then deal with this. We need to figure out how do we help bring that stress response down and help that child realize that not every little thing in their environment is a snarling hungry bear. Because guess what? That's what it's been for them. And that's the world that they're learning to cope with. So what happens when, when all this goes on? So some of you may know about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. I think that more and more people have, have become aware of this study, but still there's an awful lot who haven't. So if you run into them, for them, that's the most important study they've probably never heard of. This was really a study looking at adults and going back into their history of trauma as children and trying to connect up um, what their outcomes were over time. It's been repeated over and over in so many places, states, na nations, and so on and so forth. Now, this is not a study of people living in poverty. I wanna be really clear about that because sometimes people say, oh yeah, yeah, this is what happens to people who are poor. Mm, no, this was middle-class Americans, mostly Caucasian, college attendees, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is not your stereotypical impoverished at risk population, etc. This is a study of the general population. Okay, so keep that in mind. These are the different categories of abuse and neglect that they studied and, and household dysfunction. And yes, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, every time I give this talk, someone says, What about? It's like, Yes, I know. This is what they used in that study. This is not to argue that this is all. Um, uh, types of abuse, uh, neglect, or dysfunction. The numbers appearing on the right are how prevalent, how common these were in this population. These are crazy high numbers. 26% reported they were physically abused at least once during their childhood. Even the lowest number, that's over one in 20. That's a lot of people. Okay, so these are really, really quite common. Now, the problem is you can't quantify intensity, right? You can't say someone's abuse was twice as bad as someone else's. Um, like it doesn't work that way. But what they said was, let's ask people this yes or no, whether it happened once or happened 20 times or 300 times or 4,000 times. And let's say, if you say yes, we'll give you, we'll put a point in for that category and we'll come up with something called an ACE score. So a third said none, great, wonderful. But a quarter had at least one and four, five or six categories of yes, one in 20 for each of those. They were unexpectedly common and then they found the effects were cumulative. So a couple of graphs here. This is your risk of being developmentally delayed in the first three years of life um, based on your ACE score. If you had five, six or seven categories of yes, look at that, 75 to nearly 100% risk of developmental delay versus much lower for just one or two. And it's not just short term, it's also long term. Look at this. I'm a pediatrician. I don't have to deal with this, but my colleagues do in adult medicine. Your risk for adult heart, heart disease is tripled if you have seven or eight categories of yes in, in those ACEs versus someone who had none, right? I mean, heart disease, right? Something that a physical ailment that we can measure and count and quantify and expense and disease and death and all that. Yeah. These early experiences are baking into the biology of young children, things that play out in their health many years later. But the last point from that report was that if we get it right early on, it's way more effective and less costly than trying to figure it out later. So Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child points out a few things, right? We have some kids with brilliant intellects and there's too many emotional and behavioral things layered on top of that. I, one of my clinical duties is that I provide care for um, at the juvenile detention center in my county. I see a lot of kids that, that are actually pretty smart. They have good intellects, but things didn't go right. You know, if you don't want to care about them, okay, I can't help you with that. 
But you know what? Think about what the lost potential is to our society. What those kids might have created or contributed or done for so many others if we'd gotten it right early on. So we all lose out because this is lost brain potential. This is like sowing seeds in a field and then refusing to harvest it. So we need to figure that part out. Number two, news bulletin, kids live in families. I know that's obvious, but you can't transform the lives of children if you didn't transform the lives of their parents. So we need to figure out how to make sure they're supported, living wages, food, housing, all those sorts of things. And then finally, health and well-being is not just health care, but it's really about so many elements that span many silos. So a few numbers to remember, there are 700 new neural connections happening per second in the developing brain. We want those to happen well. Why? Because of this idea of brain plasticity. There's two types, synaptic and cellular. Don't worry about what they mean, okay? The key is actually here in this third line. Synaptic plasticity is lifelong. We are all using this to learn right now, but cellular is declining by age five. So that limits our ability to do good remediation later. It's not that you can't, it's just that you have one fewer pathway, key pathway to do this in. So this is why we shouldn't be waiting to fix speech delay until age three, uh, until age eight, because it's a lot easier at three and it's a lot easier at 18 months and so on and so forth. We can measure disparities in vocabulary as early as 18 months of life um, in between different socioeconomic groups and between the lower two groups by 24 months. But we also know that for every dollar we put into early childhood, guess what? The return on investment is four to nine dollars. Who says that? People like James Heckman, Nobel laureate in economics at the University of Chicago, way more qualified than I to, to make that point to you, but he's made this his life's work. He's not saying this is zero ROI on job training or school or whatever, but it's a much better ROI the earlier you go. And as Frederick Douglass told us long before we had CT scans and all, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So then what's going on now? We got this darn virus, we got this pandemic, okay? Families are facing challenges. That This is clear to all of us. I don't need to dwell on that. Now, this is a screenshot from, this is from months ago. Please don't squint at these numbers. They're so out of date. But this is how many people have been infected by the virus at a point in time. And a lot of people have been affected, some physically much more than others and so on. But you know what? There's a lot of people who have not been affected that have also dealt with the fallout of the virus. Our families, right? There's 83 million families in the US and they are facing the struggles, the economic struggles and the psychosocial struggles, some isolation and, and you know, virtual schooling and, 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 and all these things, right? This pandemic goes well beyond simply the infection numbers, okay? And, 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 the, and that is key. Now, the thing is, Families, child poverty struggles, they've always been present. This has not gone away. Our child poverty rates in the US are actually shockingly high and people just don't realize it. They think, oh, it's, it's not that bad, right? We, we provide support, yeah, not, not, not as much as we'd like to think. But this pandemic, I think, has made us much more aware of the deficiencies in our systems and our structures. We also know that racism has a big issue, it causes big issues for health and well-being. This report from the American Academy of Pediatrics came out in 2019. Okay, so this is pre-pandemic, pre-George Floyd, all that. Um, excellent policy statement, you can find it online. Articulates the clear evidence there is for what racism and discrimination uh, does negatively to children's health and, and offers um, uh, uh, opportunities for advocacy as well and, and guidance there. If you haven't read it, please go read this. So if you can give me a moment to just get a little artistic with you, um, there's a writer named Anatoly Broyard um, who had a chronic illness, cancer, and he, um, he talked about how he would love his ideal doctor to be like Virgil in Dante's Inferno, um, the, the trip through hell um, from uh, the Renaissance, uh, the, the poem. And he talks about how my, his doctor would be as Virgil pointing out the sights as we go. Um, and we would wrestle with my fate together. And I think for those of us in these helping professions in this pandemic, this is in a sense what we're trying to do for those we serve. And I'll just indulge me with a couple of pictures of Renaissance from Renaissance art here, a couple of paintings. Um, you can see in the lower right here, Virgil and Dante, Dante's in the red and Virgil has his hand outstretched and he's pointing out what they're seeing um, in the second circle of hell here, um, how to understand, how to explain, how to cope 
Uh, this is Delacroix. You can see, again, look at Dante there in the red. He's, he's losing his balance and this look of horror on his face. I think we've all felt like that at, at some point in this last year, haven't we, right? Like what is going on around us? But you notice what Virgil's doing. He's, he's supporting him. He's kind of holding his hand there, right? It's like, I'm here for you, even amidst all that that's, that's going on. Okay, so what can we do about all this? I will give you the solution. And actually, I won't. I'm going to give you principles of solutions because there's no one magic way to get this all fixed. So here's the things that we need. We need solutions that build capabilities. A parent who says, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say to my child. I'm not sure how to read to my squirmy toddler. Okay, we can, we can teach you that. And it's pretty easy to teach you that, but we, we do it in a kind, compassionate way. Wonderful. We need to build capacities. Parent says to me, I would love to read to my child every night, but I'm not home. I'm working my second job because we don't, I don't get paid a living wage. Okay, get them a job with a living wage. Figure this out so that they can do the job of parenting they know how to do and want to do, right? Let's figure out those other, other things that get in the way. Do things that are based in homes and communities. Address root causes. Have long-term effects. Don't go for the short-term only. Address a prevention mindset. We are so terrible in this country at prevention. Leverage those key first thousand days of life. Use evidence where it's available, but don't let that box you in. Notice I said evidence guided, not evidence based. And do things you can take to scale. Okay, because here's what's key. If you want, this is me just kind of summarizing and kind of laying out the chain here. If you have productive, happy adults, if you that's what we want. Okay, well, they need to be educationally successful. That's when they have good brain circuitry primed for school success. And that comes from those early experiences we talked about. That comes from nurturing responsive interactions with children. That means you need those adults who have the ability to do those things. And they need to know how to do these things and feel confident in that. And that comes from ultimately their surroundings or the programs, policies, and advice that we give. Okay, so just kind of me kind of putting the chain together here. So if that's the key thing, we can do intensive small initiatives, a lot of great ones, great evidence, but my goodness, they're expensive, they're hard to scale. So at the same time, not instead of, but at the same time, we also need broader but scalable larger initiatives. You don't take pick, I'm not telling you to pick one, I'm saying you need both these things and you build it into an ecosystem of support. Some families will just need those lighter touch things and others will be need much more intensive things, right? And you need all of these things in order to kind of be successful. So I'm going to give you an example that I've spent much of my life in, the Reach Out and Read program. Reach Out and Read is an early literacy program that uses the checkup that, that doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners do with young kids numerous times and takes that opportunity to talk to families and work with them and to encourage shared reading. People say, oh, this is great. You're giving away books in the clinic. People think we're a book giveaway program, and yeah, that's one of the things we do, but you know what? We're secretly a parenting support program, and I think it's really key to recognize that. If I had to summarize the entire idea in a single image, it would be this here, the prescription to read. Notice it says share books together. It doesn't just say read. It says share books together because that's really the key part there, right? This may be the most important prescription I ever hand a family, right? So reach out and read. It's in all 50 states. Um, we would love to expand more and more. There's actually some great initiatives going on in Florida that, that are getting underway to, to, to expand. Um, but it takes an existing network that's already there and leverages that and those touch points with families to make a difference. And I, Reach Out and Read is kind of like the story of the blind men touching the elephant and feeling different things. Um, yes, it's a book giveaway, but it's also an educational intervention. It's a chance for us to look, watch the child's development, right? To assess that while by watching what they do with the book. We can build that parental capacity to do that shared reading. We're helping buffer toxic stress, that touch, that moment together of togetherness, that relationship. We're assessing the health of relationships. It's a public health approach. And it's a scalable model that has actually a strong, a very strong evidence base. So of course, reach and read is not any one of these things or two of these things ultimately it's all of these things. And if you want to read more about all that, you can just Google 
The Elephant in the Clinic, which is a free report you can download that I co-authored with a, a colleague um, that talks about those eight elements and, and all, and it's not a particularly technical read um, and not particularly long either. And also, if you're not sick of hearing my voice this morning, I am the host of a new podcast started last summer from Reach Out and Read that talks about families, children, reading, books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've, we've had great fun doing it. So just go to that URL and, uh, we'll, uh, and, and we hope you subscribe. Okay, so again, we're not just doing advice. We're not just telling people to read or handing them a book. We're doing parental skill building and support by already existing skilled trusted professionals. This is not to say Reach Out and Read is the only example of this kind of work, right? There's also other things that are important, home visiting, strong, robust early childhood centers, including Head Start and others, um, other ways that we provide support to parents, right? This is an example though, of where we can really have where the rubber meets the road and we can make such a key difference. So I like to think of this as a solution for now, right? Because people said when the pandemic started, sometimes they said, reading books, how can you talk about this at a time like this? And our immediate emphatic response was, how can you not talk about it? This is what we need. This is what our families need. This is what children need. They need to know how do they maintain connection? How do they help continue brain development even in a time of deep social isolation? That it's so clear that families need support and that we need to keep doing that and we need to settle in for the long haul here. We need to support the health of relationships. This early relational health concept, I think, is so important and so key and underpins so much of what so many of you do, whether it's through direct service or policy or administration or funding or whatever the case may be. And that one of the scaffolds is shared reading. It's not the only scaffold, but it's one of them and can make so such a difference out there. Two more paintings from the Renaissance because this opportunity before us here are Virgil and Dante meeting great poets of history, right? This journey was so challenging, but yet there were these thing, things that happened that you know wouldn't have happened in, in real life. And this, this is the last painting I'll share with you. This is in the ninth circle of hell, the lowest low level um, uh, painting by Gustave Doré. There again is Virgil and Dante, Virgil's in the blue, bluish green and, and Dante in the red. This, look what's happening here. Look at, look at Virgil's face. He just looks so sad, so despondent, so almost defeated. But what's happening, this time Dante has his arm around his guide. And I think this is really important. I don't know about you, I suspect it's true, but I have had this experience so many times in this last year of deriving strengths from listening to those who I'm serving, through listening to patients and families and questions that people ask me in talks and, and people who respond to the newspaper column I write and, and so on and so forth, right? That, that even though I'm the one who's supposed to be helping them, right? Yes, but watching their strength makes a difference. So please don't forget that, that we too can derive strength and support from dealing and working with those that we're serving, that sometimes they'll put their arm around us and tell us it's okay. And that's okay and it's important and it's needed. So to wrap this up in the last few minutes here, I like to think about a public health approach to building healthy brains, okay? Kids are gonna fall. So we need nets to catch them. First net is a big net. It's also got big holes. This is our prevention net. This is what kind of everyone has access to, we hope. Okay, it's gonna catch an awful lot of those kids. But as I said, there's some big holes. So what happens to the kids that fall through? You bring out your second net. This is your screening, your target interventions, right? Things that cost more, more effort, more work, but it's gonna catch those kids. It's a smaller net. You can't scale it to everyone, but there's smaller holes. Still some holes though. And the kids who fall through, that's your treatment net. That's your really expensive net. You're really challenging to implement net. It's important, you gotta have it. Can't possibly rely on all the above nets, but you can't scale it to the level of that everyone level, that, that top net. People, kids are just gonna fall off the edge there. This is the argument for the ecology that all of these levels are necessary. None on their own are sufficient. So ask yourself, right? Where, do, where does what I do fit on this? continuum. Maybe I'm up in the primary prevention, the everyone net. 
okay, great. I'm not telling you that you need to go do the at risk or the, or the treatment net, but you need to know who those people are. And guess what? When they're looking for funding, please support them. Say, hey, we can't possibly do everything. I need you to have them funded and properly able to do what they do. And maybe you're in the treatment net and you're saying, yeah, I can't handle thousands of kids and families doing X. Not going to happen. I need someone to head this off of the pass earlier. We sometimes get into this mindset of, oh, there's a limited pot of money and we all need to fight over it. Why are we fighting with each other? We're all doing the same good work. We need to be saying, excuse me, why isn't this pot bigger? This is all really important. And you need to support me, but you also need to support all these other people. Because if they do their jobs well, we all end up being able to do our jobs well. Okay, so there's a lot, it's a simple diagram in many ways, but I think there's a lot in there about how we need to be approaching these problems, thinking about it as systemic investments. So I started by reading to you from the dot today. Why did I read the dot? Well, it's a good story beautifully drawn, beautifully told. But I also think that it's a story about relationships, right? It's a story about a relationship between a teacher and a child, about a child who's having a bad day, right? And her teacher could have said, you need to shape up young lady and have a better attitude or else you're going to the principal's office. <laughs> that wouldn't have gone well. Instead, she said, you know what, look, just make a mark, see where it takes you. And then she celebrated that, had her sign it and then she framed it and all. And Vashi took off from there, right? It was, it was a beautiful approach. However, there was another element to this. We're not inside that teacher's head, so I, we can't say this for sure, but whether it was intentional or not, but there was skill building. What did Vashi do at the end? She turned around and mentored someone else, that kid who couldn't draw a straight line with a ruler, right? So there was that key element there, right? Of how much we can build capacity and capability in this story, it's a story about the power of relationships. It's a story about the promise that's held when someone has the ability to say, let me address this and let me try to understand what's going on here. And let me not just because I'm stressed or untrained or whatever, go right to you know, punishment or demands or whatever, right? That it really made a difference there. Public investment, the brain's capacity to change is best early on. So we need to, however, make sure that we are that our spending, which is all later on, we need to also make sure it's happening early when the brain's capacity is best. And there's some promise there. Uh, this is in coming up almost on 10 years, joint resolution out of the Wisconsin legislature, unanimously through our Senate and our, and our assembly. I'm gonna read you the, uh, the, um, the resolved clause here. Resolved that policy decisions enacted by the state legislature acknowledge and take into account early brain development and will consider toxic stress, adversity, and buffering relationships, and note investment in early childhood years as strategies to achieve a lasting foundation for a more prosperous and sustainable state through investing in human capital. I, uh, I might have had a hand in writing a fair amount of that. Um, this went through, now it's a resolution. It has no funding tied to it no force of law, but it was the first state legislature in the country to put these words out there. And it helped build our children's caucus and some other things that came in the intervening time since then. Um, so it was a start and that's why I put the success kit up here doing the fist pump, hashtag winning. Uh, so I think it's very important to, to, to think about that. All right, for time, I'm not gonna play my last video here. You can find it on YouTube. Um, if you just Google change the first five thing, if I first five years and you change everything from the ounce of prevention fund, it's beautiful, it's lovely, it'll bring you to tears. Um, but uh, you can find that easily on YouTube. These slides will be made available. Um, so you can, if you don't have a chance to write this down, you'll, you'll get that later there. Um, and I wanna close here um, before I take questions uh, with a quote. While schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers, all too often preschool gaps set and train a pattern of ever increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children, so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. And I always end with this picture here. This is my wife reading to my son years ago. They were just lost in a book together, just caught in this beautiful moment. It reminds me that children are made readers in the laps of their parents, and that parents are their child's first and best early teachers. 
And we need, if we can help make sure that parents see themselves that way, are comfortable with doing that, and are confident in doing that, we are gonna see absolutely massive payoffs well down the road in so many different ways. My public facing social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, sorry, haven't figured out Instagram or TikTok, um, please follow along. Uh, my email address, if there's, if there's other things later on down the road, I mentioned the podcast earlier. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to turn to questions. And I will, I just also wanna say thank you so much to our sign language interpreters. I know how tiring it is to keep up with this over so much uh, time. And we appreciate uh, your efforts and the organizers efforts for making this uh, all accessible to as many as possible. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nivsaria. As you know, we're about to begin a really large community effort focused on zero to three. And you've given us so much to consider and think about as we begin this journey. We've gotten a lot of questions and we have very little time. So let me just get started. Um, you know, a lot of comments on that your, your phrase, no app is the lap. There is no app to replace your lap, yes. So do you have any sort of recommendations on limits on screen time for zero to three mm -hmm. and, and interactive videos and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. What I'm gonna do is actually refer people to the um, excellent uh, work that the American Academy of Pediatrics has done on thinking about digital media. They, uh, if you just type in AAP digital media into Google, it'll come up. There's also some great um, things that on there that help families think about different ages, because here's the thing, S thinking about screens for a four-year-old is really different from thinking about screens for a 12-month-old, right? People say, oh, it's, they're, well, they're all young kids. Uh, there's actually a world of difference developmentally and a world of difference in the evidence about what does or doesn't work. So I would refer people to those statements. There, there's some really good parent um, facing sheets on there and some online tools to help people figure out what is or isn't appropriate. Speaking of the American Academy of Pediatrics, I have read that racism study and it's very, very good. Do you recommend the introduction of cultural competence in the zero to three early learning space? Yes. And I would go even further to say that um, I, I think, you know, we many have, have said that it's it's almost impossible to be culturally competent in anyone else's culture, you know, because we all have different approaches that cultural humility, right? That coming in and saying, I don't necessarily know the answer or I might be making an assumption here. So let me ask um, is, is a great approach um, to be able to find out what people want. I've had people assume things about me because they say, well, you have a South Asian name and you look like you're South Asian. Oh, are you vegetarian? Well. Many would be, um, I don't happen to be. Um, and I, I was born in London, I grew up in Queens. I mean, you know, um, right. But uh, I appreciate people gently gently asking when it, when it makes a difference. That's cultural humility, right? To not make an assumption about things. Do you support males serving as early learning teachers? Definitely so. This is actually turning into a bit of a crisis in a lot of child facing fields, um, including I might add pediatrics. Um, we are seeing fewer and fewer men going into pediatrics. And uh, in my own division of 40 plus general pediatricians, we have relatively few men. Um, and this becomes a challenge sometimes um, just because we've had parents ask us, um, can you recommend a male pediatrician? Um, I had a mother a few years ago say to me, I th I'm, th they were black and they said, a mother said, I really want my child to see a black male pediatrician because I really think it's important he see a role model of someone who's educated and respected and all this stuff. Can you please refer me to someone, right? You're lovely, but I, I really think this is important. I said, of course. And then I stopped and thought and thought and thought and to my absolute horror could not find a single black male pediatrician in Madison, Wisconsin. Yes, that's how hard it was. We found one family doctor which is just ridiculous, right? Um, so yes, people want those role models. And I think that role those role models help. And it also helps increase the diversity of how we think and talk about um, relationships with kids and so on. Thank you. And one last question. Of course, we now understand the importance of investment early, lots of investment early. There's a big ROI of payoff. But somebody asked, 
Does it help to give teens those experiences, you know, at, at an older age that they didn't have when they were in that zero to three time frame? Um, I think so. So remember, uh, re remediation, rehabilitation is always possible. We just need to make sure we're actually don't do little bits of support. You know, like I see this again with the with the youth of the juvenile detention center. Right, we can offer supportive environments and all that, and thinking and all, and then you put them right back into a world of poverty and lack of opportunity in a system that frankly doesn't offer them a way out. Is it any wonder we see people reoffending when they just don't see another path that's out there? So offering those, not just opportunities, but also offering a, a roadmap to, this is how you're not gonna need, be, be stuck into these little boxes again here. Um, we need to think about that. We are great at providing just enough support in our country so people can get by, but we're not actually providing enough support that they can meaningfully and easily lift themselves out of the situations they're in. And we need to recognize that and reckon with that. Absolutely, social determinants of health all around. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time today. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Beth to finish up. Sorry, that was amazing. And of course, as always, we wish we had more time. You've really validated why it's vital that we start from the earliest years with our children. Uh, and you've, uh, you've re-inspired me to be a good reader to my grandchildren. So thank you. Following the summit, we will be circulating the Q&As to all attendees and posting recordings of the keynote presentation and the full summit on our website and our YouTube channel. We encourage you to share this information with your colleagues. At this time, we're delighted to present our last fiscal year's annual report video a year of resiliency. Last October, I arrived at the Juvenile Welfare Board full of hope. I've always been passionate about children and JWB has been shaping the future of our county's youngest citizens for 75 years. In my first few months as JWB CEO, my team and I got right to work. We hosted our annual Children's Summit to bring child well-being data to life and shared research and best practices with our board. But nothing could have predicted or prepared us for a global pandemic. Right away, we had to reframe and rethink how our staff and funded agencies would work. So much was at stake for our county's children. We were able to respond swiftly and pivot to proactively get ahead of things. This would not have been possible without our strong foundation, smart staff, and solid relationships that were already in place. On March 3rd, we launched a coordinated COVID response plan with dozens of calls, both to the community and with our providers. These eventually morphed to virtual meetings, which informed our, our providers and staff and also served to problem solve. We released dollars to stabilize programs and the workforce. That first week, we trained all JWB staff on technology. This allowed us to work remotely from home with all of the capabilities from the office. We also updated all of the IT equipment where needed to assist staff. We wrote and implemented a temporary telecommuting policy. And by the time the safe at home orders were issued, staff were successfully working remotely. We also adopted new policies aligned with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and onboarded staff remotely. I was one of the first. I started as JWB's new CFO on April 13th. My team got right to work, helping agencies apply for federal relief funds and processing dozens of budget amendments. Yes, we reviewed and approved approximately 75 budget amendments for PPE and other COVID-related needs. We also had to review our accounting processes. We had to pay invoices and perform payroll remotely. 
In spite of this year's challenges, we received a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. It was our first year applying, so we can all be proud because it really speaks to JWV's fiscal responsibility with our taxpayers' dollars. We were dealing with contingency funds that were promptly approved by our budget so that we could fill in the gaps in our community relative to food relief, family safety, and more. So all of this kept our contract folks pretty busy. Yes, it did. We had procurements to meet COVID-related needs in addition to other planned procurements like our non-operating and capital projects. Of course, we also prepared JDB's annual budget that was approved by the board in the fall. Something as simple as signing a contract proved tough to do virtually. Implementing DocuSign for electronic signatures really was a game changer. Totally agree, Pete. DocuSign really made things easiest, easier for us in the contracts unit. But the real work happened with our provider staff safely delivering services following CDC guidelines. And only after that was in place, did my unit determine how to safely monitor those programs out in the field. Yes, four of our neighborhood family centers achieved licensure last year in spite of the pandemic. We also addressed challenges with data collection and staff retention. In particular, with our early learning centers and our out-of-school time, we showed our appreciation for that staff with car parades and face masks proclaiming, I'm essential for kids. All this while many of us were homeschooling our children. Oh yes, and so many parents like us were stressed. That's why we hosted our very first Facebook Live event with child psychologists who offered self-care tips and ways to soothe children during COVID. What I loved is how we leveraged our collective partnerships to fill gaps, especially around food. We also expanded our Harvard-based training for children's literacy, and we created music videos in the summer to promote summer reading. Imagine. My team has to learn to do community work on the computer screen. We held virtual conversations with our community councils, back to school events, and engage our face-based partners in making masks and handing out PPE. We also leveraged our family services initiative to help parents with back rent and utilities. When federal funds arrived, our navigators helped families access those funds. And we took our Friday morning meetings virtual, all 70 plus partners. Our board meetings moved from in-person to virtual, which took a huge amount of effort. And then still in the midst of the pandemic, our public meetings had to become public again, requiring even more effort to keep everyone safe. That's right, Beth. We retrofitted our conference rooms for safety and we now have the ability to broadcast to other conference rooms and out to the internet. We also hung signs, installed hand sanitizer stations, and increased disinfectant protocols in our building. What we did well was amass reliable and timely information to guide decisions. Press briefings, executive orders, federal legislation, government meetings, these were all being tracked on a daily basis and the information changed hourly. And we held town meetings like this one to connect and communicate with our staff. And here come our staff now. Last year, our funded program served more than 60,000 children and families. Plus, thousands more benefited from collective work to address childhood hunger, grade-level reading, and preventable child deaths. We did this by investing $79.7 million to strengthen children's lives and improve their futures. With the arrival of COVID in March, JWB responded to meet immediate needs, starting with our funded agencies. JWB instantly recognized that in the blink of an eye, the needs of our children, families, staff, and community had, had changed. And 
they were very responsive about pulling out the resources that they had available and we accessed every one of them. They gave us information, resources, support, but most of all, they gave us peace of mind. The pandemic triggered an unprecedented need for food. JWB responded by investing 1.2 million to nourish children and collectively provided a million and a half free meals to kids at break spot sites when schools closed in March due to COVID. Because of the relationships built through the Childhood Hunger Initiative, our members were able to react quickly to ensure that no child ever goes hungry. We learned that half of those receiving assistance had never before visited food pantries. The Juvenile Welfare Board responded in a big way. They not only provided relief funding to help restock the shelves of our food pantry, but it helped replenish the shelves of food pantries throughout Pinellas County. With the rise of domestic violence, JWB remodeled property so survivors and their children were safe. We also paid rent and utility bills through our Family Services Initiative, and when federal aid arrived, we helped families access those funds to prevent evictions. Our new children's literacy program served more than 13,000 children and parents last year, helping mitigate COVID-related learning loss. In the words of Frederick Douglass, once you can read, you will be forever free. When COVID hit, we had an opportunity to partner with organizations like Read Strong and new programs like Antonio Brown and his community barbershop book club. We know that we are stronger together. And I really want to thank the folks at JWB for helping us restore that legacy of literacy for our scholars going forward into the future. With partnerships already in place, we were better equipped to address the increase in mental health needs during COVID. JWB's Children's Mental Health Initiative, or CMHI, has been an invaluable partner to all the pediatric providers and community health centers of Pinellas and to our community. They have helped us reframe challenges to opportunities prior to and during the pandemic. Our CMHI team found opportunity with this challenge. They use our telehealth platform to provide counseling and to continue our weekly meetings with our community partners. Together with our partners, JWB led a wellness work group aimed at addressing unique needs of families in our community. If you think back to April in 2020, I'm sure you remember it being a stressful time. And now imagine another layer on top of that, a cultural and language barrier. Together with the Juvenile Welfare Board and Pinellas County, we formed the task force Abrazo a la Distancia, which means a virtual hug. We were able to retrain our families on online education platforms, start providing fresh food through a drive-through format, we even held a virtual party with the students where they created their own masks. Childcare is the common denominator that allows so many other businesses to thrive. Their work makes the work of other essential workers possible. The state of childcare in our county was fragile before the pandemic. Low wages, staff retention, shortage of qualified staff were challenges we consistently faced. But COVID has pretty much devastated the childcare industry. Right away, we reached out to the Juvenile Welfare Board to support our providers. From appreciation videos to PPE, to drive-through parades, even masks that say, I am essential for kids. Last year, JWB recommitted ourselves to the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. If the CEO does not own it, it doesn't work. And Beth is owning it. This is her initiative and bringing in her team to be able to do that. So the recommitment, the refocus, the belief system that this does drive business results. And most importantly, it reconnects you that much stronger to the community that you serve. Thanks to Beth's leadership and that of her team, our board received monthly presentations highlighting our past performance in our key focus areas 
We also heard comprehensive presentations from content experts about unmet needs of children. Despite the challenges and the constraints of the pandemic, our board was relentless in its commitment to approve and adopt a new strategic plan by the end of the year. It's been a year of reframing, a refocusing, and you'll see that in our strategic plan and specifically in our areas of early learning from zero to three. This new strategic direction is extremely important. Helping our children to grow and learn throughout their lives. What's really important is that this is clearly a greater return on investment for us as a community. As our year came to a close, we bid farewell to one of our board members, retiring public defender, Bob Dillinger. Then we mourned the untimely loss of another, State Attorney Bernie McKay. Both will be remembered for their 20 years of dedicated service to our board and for their passion to always do what's right for kids. It was a year of resiliency, of reframing by turning crisis to opportunity responding to meet immediate needs and fill gaps. Rethinking our usual ways of doing business. Recommitting ourselves to the principles that guide our work and mission. And responsibly investing so that all children in Pinellas County have equitable opportunity to fulfill their potential and achieve meaningful and purposeful lives. It was truly a year of resiliency, a year of restoring hope. Good morning, my name is Michael McCurek, and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Juvenile Welfare Board. True to our theme, 2020 was a year of resiliency, underscoring our ability to bounce back from life's unforeseen circumstances. In spite of last year's challenges, our staff and partners have accomplished a lot. Because we've had a solid framework already in place with established and trusted partners, JWB was able to react and respond swiftly to community needs, rethink our work, and ultimately restore hope to Pinellas County and our children and families. For 75 years, JWB has, in its mission, been focused on investing wisely in the future of our county children. And last year, we lived up to that promise. With the adoption of our new strategic plan, we've added a more targeted focus on early childhood development. The importance of this focus was echoed beautifully by Dr. Depesh Navasare. We thank you for sharing your research. Early childhood experiences really do alleviate everything. And, pre and the presentation today that we just heard validates that JWB is focused in the right direction. So as we close our seventh annual Children's Summit, I invite each of you to stay involved, to visit our website at www.pinellas, JWB, let me try that again, www.jwbpinellas.org. Follow us on social media and continue to engage with our work groups, initiatives and campaigns. When we launch zero to three, please stand with us to ensure that infants and toddlers are able to meet appropriate physical, social, emotional, and cognitive development milestones. We all want our children to be ready to learn, ready to succeed, and ready to thrive in homes, school, and neighborhoods that are healthy and safe. This year has taught us about how resilient we can be 
and the importance of working together to strengthen community. Thank you to our funded agencies and partners for all you do. Thank you to all who helped organize today's event, including our staff at JWB, SPC Collaborative Labs, and of course our interpreters. And thanks to each of you for sharing your time with us today. Let's continue to lean on and learn from one another and make 2021 another resilient year.